George Kilpatrick, inspiration for the nation, celebrating people we feel good about. Well, we have the barrister himself, Mr. Bill Simmons, the executive director of the Syracuse Housing Authority. Now, B Bill, I can literally say you and I have grown up together in Syracuse, having attended SU together, but Bill's older than me, just so y'all know, he was here before me. <laughs> I'm going back, I'm, I'm, I'm going back into the days of track suit wearing Bill Simmons. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, we got the uh, late, late 70s. Late yeah, 70s. That goes, that's, that goes back away, George. Little bit, <laughs> little bit, but always good to see you, Bill. Yeah. And um, from being on the council, uh, for 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 many years, and and now over here at the Syracuse Housing Authority, I think a lot of people don't realize that uh, when you went to law school, you were also working full time. So that was how did you do that? By the way, before we even get to the housing stuff, how did you do that? Well, um, I don't know, George. It's just one of those things. You know, I always wanted to go to law school. And I didn't get an opportunity to go to law school when we uh, graduated from Syracuse back in um, 79. And so um, naturally, as you know, I got stayed in Syracuse and I got involved in local government because my major was political science. And I wanted to get involved in local government, did that, served on the school board and city council. Um, I forgot about the served, school board stint. Yeah, yeah. School board stint, uh, city council, served in, um, you know, uh, uh, administration and the um, uh, Tom Young uh, administration over at City Hall. And so, um, but when Tom Young left office due to um, term limits, um, I ended up out at New Venture Gear. And New Venture Gear was a great living because, um, you know, it allowed me to do a lot of things for my family, you know, and and uh, uh, the kinds of vacation, educational opportunities and things like that. However, um, I knew that I didn't want to be at New Venture Gear for 30 years and didn't think New Venture Gear was going to be there as well. Mm -hmm. So I had to, at that point, I was making a decision that, you know, to go in a different direction. And at that time, I was 40 years old. I had married two kids. Uh, and so... Um, if I was going to make a transition, it's going to have to be something that I really, really always wanted to do and love and going to put that kind of effort into it. And so uh, I ended up getting in, in law school at Turkish University. Now, as you point out, I used to work at New Venture Gear, 11 o'clock at night till seven in the morning. And then from there, I head up to the law school. I go down to the city council for meetings. And then I, in the evenings, I would head up to my kids' basketball games. And so in a, in a four-year period of time, uh, I... And the 24 hour day, I was up 20 hours a day for four years every day. Every so, day. Every day. And so, you know, just one of those things where um, I was just so super motivated to accomplish that goal. Um, and, but I wouldn't wish, I wouldn't wish that were my worst enemy. I wouldn't want anybody else to go through what I went through uh, to get my law degree. But sometimes that's the kind of sacrifice that you have to make. Some of the, you know, I just think it's important for people to realize that when you lock in on something and you're really motivated, you really can't do anything. Um, if you, if you got the, if you have the motivation. Yeah. You talked about, um, sacrifice when you were going through that, did it feel like that at the time? Um, and, and, or you just, when did it become a habit? Because I'm sure initially being on the council, you know, working all night and going to law school and having to study and put those hours in, it didn't feel, you can look back, look back on it now nostalgically and say, I was on the grind. But in that moment, when did when when did it lock in for you that that was a habit that is now? Oh, this is the life, and family knows this is what it is. Like like you said, you're still showing up for the things. Um, Mama knows what is it? You know what what it is. When did it kick in that? Oh wait, oh I can do this because I'm sure initially you didn't feel like that. No, you know, well, I um well when I, initially I really didn't know what I was walking into. Um, and so with everything going on, um, there was clearly some adjustments that I had to make. Um, you know, I didn't have, going through that whole experience, I ended up getting high blood pressure, you know, mm -hmm. with the amount of stress and lack of sleep. So I brought that high blood pressure, uh, blood pressure on myself. Um, there were, you know, it was very, very difficult early on trying to strike a balance between study and work time and all those kinds of things. So yeah, in the beginning it was difficult, but, um, 
you know, I was able to kind of figure out, figure it out, adjust the time schedule, my, my time uh, management. And um, I was also really just able to take it one day at a time mm-hmm. because when you start to think about, wow, I'm 40 years old, I've got to be in law school for the next four years. Um, you know, I got this, you know, all these things going on. When you look at the big picture, it was overwhelming. It was like doing a, um, a tight rope walk. You know, mm-hmm. when you're doing a tight rope walk, they tell you, don't look down. You right. know, it was that kind of thing. you can't look ahead. So what I decided to do mm-hmm. once I got my figured out my time management, which meant a lack of sleep. When I figured out my time management, um, it was, then it was a matter of just take it one day at a time. And one day led into a week. Each week led into a month. Each month led into a semester. Semester led into the year. And then next, you know, I'm down at the uh, four years later. I'm down at the graduation ceremony, getting my cap and gown. And uh, you know, I, I I just don't I don't tell everybody, but I'm not afraid to tell people there today that when I went down and got my cap and grunt gown, and I realized that this was the finish line, it was just o- so overwhelming that tears just came out of my eyes uncontrollably. And mm-hmm. so it's that, that, so when you see people do that on TV after they've gone through a mission, uh, or when they won a championship, yeah, that happens when you go I'm, through something like that. I feel like you were, it was c- catching you up just a few minutes ago. Like you, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, when you think about it, it, it brought some emotion to you right here and right now. Absolutely. And um, yeah, because it was a real challenge. And, and, and it was um, an accomplishment when, I, when it's all said and done, you know, because for me personally, I was always about personal growth and achievement. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, um, you know, I don't mind saying that when I was on the city council and, and going to law school, you know, was I trying to prepare to uh, maybe do some other, run for some other offices, electoral offices. But when I got through going through and achieving my law degree and my bar uh, license, passing the bar exam, the way I went through it, there was a there was a personal stuff of achievement that you, you just couldn't match in anything else that I was going to do in my life after getting that law degree and the way I went about uh, doing it. And so for me at that point, it was no longer about going after the important job as much as it was about going after the, doing the important work. And so it was. Um, uh, I really it, it, yeah. When I really think back on it, it does really still stir up emotion in me because it was the ultimate grind. We should point out that you were also, when you worked in the Tom Young administration, and it just occurred to me, you were the commissioner of aviation. I forgot about that part. Yeah, yeah right. it was it deputy commissioner. Deputy commissioner, yeah. deputy commissioner, right. Yeah, deputy aviation. And yeah. so, um, you know, been involved in local government in a lot of different capacities, you know, for, you know, for the past 40 years. And, um, and so it's, you know, a little bit ironic because when I first came here, um, I stayed at Syracuse University as a freshman. I stayed in the Brewster Bowling Dormitory and who knew that I was going to finish out my career two blocks away, you know, at the public housing, uh, just be in that neighborhood uh, for most of the time. Because the other part of uh, that whole experience was when I, um, prior to working in the city administration uh, under Tom Young, I did work in the school district and uh, parks and recreation uh, as a rec aide at Wilson Park, which is right down there in the Pine right down there. neighborhood. And so, you know, a lot of the guys who grew up down there over the years, they, you know, hey, Bill, you know, when I introduce people to them um, and they'll say, yeah, they'll always go back and say, yeah, Bill was my coach at Wilson Park and um, he was a real inspiration to all of us. And so it just feels good um, and to still be down in the Pioneer Homes neighborhood today looking to transform um, the, that that neighborhood as well. Am I right in that you also did some coaching and, and things like that in, in sports as well? Yeah, I, um, you know, especially when I was down at working at Parks and Recreation and at uh, Wilson Park, um, did did a lot of coaching with the young men, you know, because it's the kind of thing that I did even growing up in the Bronx mm-hmm. when I was um, working as a community service aide in Bronxdale Houses. You know, I grew up in Bronxdale Houses, and um, which is now called Sonia Sotomayor. And so, um, again, working in public housing since 18, you know, uh, 17, actually, uh, it's been a real mission for me. And so, it, you know, uh, like most of us at that age and at that time, you know, all we did was eat and sleep basketball. Um, and um, and so, uh, but I use that 
those 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 the, that motivation for for many of the young kids and try to work with them and and make my involvement with coaching young men more than just about basketball because oftentimes we would sit after a couple of workout sessions and I get into free lunch over at Wilson Park and bring it in and we just sit around and have a rap session about life and those are the kinds of things that the young men remember and appreciate the most. So we um have had many folks and we've had the civil New York Civil Liberties Union on talking about I-81. We've had the Blueprint 15 talking about I-81 and the blueprint for the area. But you know what each, everybody said? What It's the housing authority that has the final say as to what is going to happen with the housing piece. So we're, tell us, give us the lay of the land in terms of the, uh, when the housing is going to come down, when it's going to move, what, where are you in that process? Break it down for the listeners. You the man, you got, you got the information for us. Well, George, as you know, um, this whole concept of transforming the area started back in um, 2000 and um, between 2014 and 16, when we realized that the there was an opportunity here with, with, with I-81 potentially coming down or rebuilding it um, and this potential disruption in the neighborhood. Um, and so as a result of that, the, um, I went to um, San Francisco where the old Embarcadero Highway was and it came down due to the um, uh, earthquake. Myself, Van Robinson, Andy Maxwell was representing the city administration. And the purpose of the in, going out there, we were invited by New Urbanism, was to see that what a high, what a community can look like once the highway came down. And so, you know, it was um, a lot of good things happening in the neighborhood, housing-wise, and most importantly, economic development-wise. And um, so I said to the gentleman who had invited us out there, I said, look, there's going to be a lot of disruption in the neighborhood, especially if there's going to be... Um, uh, a taking of any property if they really rebuild the highway to federal standards. And I know that with um, uh, with with these kind of federal takings of properties, it's not nothing that you, you can't win those situations, but how can we leverage this opportunity to get something for the community? And that's when uh, the gentleman said, well, there is 1992, President Clinton came out with the executive order, which says environmental justice. And it's explicitly said that if there's going to be a major disruption in a community of uh, low income and predominantly of color, there has to be some mitigations and enhancements for the community. So, you know, I didn't want to, uh, I did a little research and I said, well, if we're going to really ask for something or uh, do something here, I better have a plan. And so we hired a consultant, Gilmore King, back in 2016. They said, look, Bill, you have a real opportunity here with the highway coming down with these properties over here at Pioneer Homes that are located by Syracuse University, where all the major employers are. And you're also right next to emerging downtown. You could do something very different here that will deconcentrate poverty, that will um, put in new housing. Because as you know, Pioneer Homes was the first public housing in New York State, built in 1937 and one of the first five in the country. And so... Um, deconcentrate poverty, putting some real new housing stock for residents and um, uh, and 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 have a mixed income uh, community and create some real opportunities and amenities for residents here. So <clears throat> part of the reason why the story sort of lags a little bit was mainly because we didn't know what the Department of Transportation was going to do with I-81, right? That decision got drawn right. out for, mm -hmm. for over a year. Right. But I'm, I'm sorry, for over 10 years. 10 but, years. I was on the committees, worked very, very closely with the um, uh, DOT, and we, the Housing Authority, was supportive of the street grid option, along with Van Robinson and so many other groups in this community, because we thought that by tearing down I-81, it was going to be complementary to the vision we had created down here by tearing up the super blocks and making the connectivity and um, tearing down you know, one of the biggest barriers in terms of redeveloping in, in, the, in the Pioneer Homes community, you know, is the old I-81. And having that torn down was going to create a new vision and, and, and uh, for, for that neighborhood. So um, a lot of delay was with I-81. And um, when we got close to about two, three years ago, when we got close to um, the record of decision, um, I had a meeting 
at uh, Tumi Abbott Towers and I brought in the um, uh, a lot of the state players um, with, as it relates to housing and urban redevelopment. And I said, look, we have a plan here. Um, I-81 is going to come down. Are there resources to enhance this plan? And so um, clearly there was. And, um, and we've been working with a developer, M McCormick Baron Salsa. They've been in the business for 25 years. They've done these kinds of mixed income communities through public housing um, in, you know, in a number of communities. Uh, and so we hired them and we've been partnering with them, master planning with the residents um, and pulling together the resources to move forward with the plan. The other component to all of this is that um, when you're dealing with a footprint of maybe 1,000 households and right. as a result, 3,000 residents, you know, and you're talking about demolishing houses and rebuilding, um, you got to move at the speed of trust. And so it takes a little while to make sure that all the residents are feeling comfortable with the plan and that, you know, something good is going to happen here for them and getting all of their input um, and, you know, finding the resources. Because ultimately this plan that is going to take some 10 years to implement will be close to $800 million. So um, that kind of thing is complicated with, 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 um, with the, all the residents on it. And as you know, the Department of Housing and Urban Development the Federal Department of Fair Housing, they're on my shoulders all the time now looking, okay, Bill, we're going to watch you, make sure you cross your T's, dot the I's, and make sure you follow the letter of the right. law about resident participation. We want to know where they're going and what they're coming back to and when. So it's a complicated process, that alone, not to mention trying to get all the dollars lined up from the federal and state government um, to implement a, a, a project of this magnitude. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm happy to say that the plan, two things I'm happy to say is that the plan deconcentrates poverty in a way that doesn't demolish the neighborhood and disperse the people like you've seen in the fifties and sixties, but right. it, 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 it invests in the neighborhood and we invite people in. So it's so mixed income housing, mixed use. Um, and we're able to do that because in that, in the footprint that we're talking about, the Syracuse Housing Authority has some vacant land so we can build new and have people move from the old public housing into some of the new units and then demolish those and build new and keep doing this in phases uh, so that the vast majority of the people, probably some 45%, will only have to move once and stay on the footprint. So, so when... Very... I'm sorry, George. So so, so, so th th what was the last thing you said? I didn't want to talk over you. Yeah, no, I'm just saying that 45%, the way we designed this out is that 45% of the residents will be able to move just once from the old housing into the new and stay on the footprint. So when is the timetable for the first people to move out? They'll be, from what I understand, they'll be given vouchers or what you just described is that hopefully you'll have something new built for them to go to. But what is the timetable for the first residents to be asked to move and what will they be given and where are they going? So, um, the, we're we're very very close to um, getting the funding for the redevelopment of Olivers Oliver Towers. That's one of our existing um, senior high rise buildings. That building needed a lot of work, so we wanted mm -hmm. to start there. Um, those residents, um, <clears throat> through attrition over the past couple of years, we've been able to empty out um, what they call you know two or three stacks of apartments, so that we can redevelop those apartments and then again take the residents that are in the existing apartments, move them into the new and redevelop in that way. We've always done our remodeling of our high rise buildings in that manner and format. The other thing we're doing is we're starting out, um, we'll also be starting out at um, uh, McKinney Manor. Now we're starting out at McKinney Manor for a lot of reasons. One, it's closest to the downtown area. So it's very, very marketable. We're starting out there also because there are 75 units on that footprint and there's a lot of green space. So you can build a greater density there. Um, and there's only about 75 families that we would have to relocate. Um, and then we also started there because it's furthest from I-81 and we, we got tired of waiting on that decision and right. that project to come down. So with the where we stand right now is that I would suspect that in the next several months, early 2024, we'll have the funding um, to uh, begin demolishing those units. But again, through attrition, instead of having to move 75 families, 
we're probably down to about 60. Of the 60 that we've been working with, 30 of them families, those families today said that they want to remain in public housing. So as it stands today, maybe 30 might want to relocate um, in the neighborhood uh, throughout the city of Syracuse or throughout the county. And then after a 18 month period, after we demolish and rebuild, they would come back to public housing. And you know, one, one of the things that I learned in doing relocation uh, on behalf of the state when they tore down um, Kennedy Square and um, town and, and the redevelopment of, of Harrison House, yeah. Harrison Towers, was that um, with many of these residents, you have to have intense case management. Someone has to be working with them all the time and every day and finding housing opportunities, taking them, taking them to res, taking those residents to visit those sites, working through with them on the paperwork. Because when you're in, when you take a voucher and you move into private sector, um, now you got to be responsible for uh, utilities, utilities, and, you know, those kind of things and things that many of the uh, uh, aspects that m many of our residents have not been used to or ha haven't had to deal with in the past. So. We have uh, intense case management from the Circus Housing Authority uh, 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 service coordinators. We've brought in a group called Urban Strategies. Uh, they've done this thing nationally um, over the years and uh, also with uh, the help of our uh, uh, not-for-profit um, component, Blueprint 15. So there's a, a great deal of um, intense focus on the residents in this process of moving and, and uh, a relocation. And then also when they return in terms of investment in those families with you know the kinds of um, educational opportunities and wellness opportunities that will be in the community um, when, when they return. And this is all based in trust. So from what I heard you say, if all goes well, the funding pops in. So the first units would be available aside from the, um, Almas Oliver Tower um, redevelopment, the first real sign of progress on this project, won't, we won't see that until 2026, based on what I'm hearing you say. No, we'll see that in 2024. 2024. Yes, you'll start to see families relocate and tearing down McKinney Manor. Oh, okay. But I mean, I'm talking about the new version of that. Oh, right? yeah. The new version, yeah. And, and folks returning you'll start seeing that in 2025. Now, are you going to keep the name McKinney Manor or some form of that? Like well, we haven't really talked about it, um, about the naming of some of these future uh, developments. I mean, you know, that's something that we can continue to talk about. I mean, I'm thinking about, right, because, you know, the reason why, obviously, Judge Langston McKinney's name is on that building is because of the fierce advocacy that he did uh, through legal aid is it legal aid or legal services? One of them um, uh, uh, for for those residents there. So I would hope that his name would go with whatever's new. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I'm sure we'll be having those discussions. As a matter of fact, um, I think it was uh, probably seven years ago when we first came out with 2016, 17, when we first came out with the plan. Um, I met with um, Judge McKinney, and we drove through the neighborhood, and I explained to him what we were going to do. And he was 100% for it. Um, we never got around to determining the renaming of that site, but it makes all the all, all the sense. And right. I think we all have a lot of admiration for the judge. Yeah, we would want to see that legacy continued somewhere, somehow, right? Sure. Uh, because of that legacy. What else, uh, Bill, do we need to know specifically about the Housing Authority's plans around this area? Because you, like, the, the word that you used that stuck with me was moving at the speed of trust. And um, there's a lot of there's a lot at stake uh, because the fear, as you know, is that here we go again, right? We saw what happened with the I-81 removal, um, the I-81 construction. I'm sorry, and the destruction of uh, this black community, and the fear that the develop this will this will not happen in the way that we imagine or in the vision that you just described. How do you assure residents, how do you assure community that at least those who seek to return will have the opportunity to do so? It's by, you have to do it by law. As I said at the, you know, at the top of the show, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. They're, gonna, they're watching you. They, they're watching. Okay. And so, you know, see, and what happens is people see gentrification take place all the time, right? You know, we, you and I saw it take place in Harlem and yeah. other places. 
But the big difference was that those were private landlords. Right. As opposed to this is public housing. Right. And these residents have rights that you can never imagine that people would have in the private sector when the landlord says, look, I'm going to tear this down. I'm going to rebuild. I'm going to charge what I want. And so that's where people can't confuse the two. This is public housing and these families have a right of return. And it's not based on ACLU, Bill Simmons, City Hall protecting them. They have federal rights that the HUD, matter of fact, I'm not going to get a dime from the HUD or New York State until I can prove where these folks are going and what they're coming back to. So mm. that should assure everyone that they're going to remain in place. You know, the other thing I want to say about I-81, and even though it's two different projects, is that one of the reasons why we wanted to do the street grid and one of the reasons why the DOT chose the street grid was because if they rebuild the, the highway to federal standard, it meant that it had to become wider and that there would have been taking of the public housing property and then people would have been forced to move again and then there would have been really, here we go again. But in this situation where um, I-81 is going to be, uh, the business loop will be right under and uh, taking down the viaduct, um, the DOT is saying that those residents do not have to move because there won't be any taking of property. Now, that doesn't mean that the housing authority and residents don't still have some concerns about I-81 when it comes down, the quality of the air, the quality of the noise, and all of those other inconveniences that's going to happen during construction. And so, you know, we've been working with the DOT to make sure that their mitigation um, measures are going to be in place. And in fact, that many of the residents will um, feel comfortable with the protections that will be in place. But for those residents that might want to relocate for a period of time, we're going to accommodate those individuals as well. Um, the, in, the families that live in Tumi Abbott Towers, it's a 300 uh, uh, unit senior disabled building, there's not really a lot of place for those individuals to go. They want to remain in place, but they want protections like some- But is Tumi Abbott of going to be affected? Is Tumi Abbott coming down too? No, Tumi Abbott is not going to be affected. No, it's not going to get torn down. So, no. and, and, let me, and let me, while I'm on this train, so Pioneer Homes definitely affected, McKinney Manor affected. What about Central Village? Ultimately, Central Village will, will be a part of this redevelopment, you know, further down the line. Okay. And uh, but they, they, it will ultimately get the ball the, the, the demolished, bringing in new streets to make the neighborhoods more walkable and safer. Eyes on the street, encourage wellness, um, and be able to take a part of some of the um, new YMCA that will be in that neighborhood, as well as the early. Is, is that a, is that happening? Uh, the uh, um, Blueprint Fifteen has received a lot of monies from the city and the state. Um, and we're doing some fundraising to make those projects make those projects come to fruition, and they're working with us in terms of um, our time frame and getting the dollars from the state to uh, demolish some of those properties. So that's so, all in the process. So it would be a, a YMCA that wouldn't be the new downtown Y, would it, or would it be? I don't know because I know that. Yeah. Um, the, I'm just asking. Um, I, I'm just asking yeah, no, since Blue you brought Blue it up. Has been in conversations with the YMCA. And the YM, the downtown YMCA has been looking for a new location. So mm -hmm. it could turn out to be the case. Um, and then early childhood center that the Blueprint 15 is building, as you know, that's critical uh, to breaking the cycle of poverty is having early childhood education, having young people ready to go to school and be successful once they reach the ages one through 12. Um, and so it's just going to be a lot of good amenities down there to help families thrive and succeed. Last point you want to make, Bill, before we go. Yeah, it's an exciting project. It's complicated because of, you know, trying to pull dollars in from the federal, state government, city government as well uh, to bring this vision forward um, to make sure that the residents have input and engagement and understanding what we're doing here. Um, and then to um, uh, ultimately uh, make sure that these residents are, you know, moving and coming back is probably the most complicated part of the whole project. But we think it's a, it's a great vision um, because of the location and because of not only are we putting down amenities that really help families thrive, but when you have mixed income housing, and we've seen it happen in all the way down in Atlanta, in Tampa, uh, all the way up to Pittsburgh, um, these mixed income market mixed income developments that people are very, very skeptical of in Syracuse because they haven't really seen it to this scale. You, you, you put together an informal network that creates an opportunity for residents as well. Mm -hmm. And so if I live in a neighborhood 
Um, and I, you know, and I'm, uh, I, I earn $13,000 a year, $15,000 a year, like many of the residents in Pioneer Homes currently do. And I live with a family where there's some nurses, doctors, individuals who work up at Syracuse University uh, or in my neighborhood. And, you know, little Billy is graduating from high school. My neighbor says, well, what's this girl going to do now? Right, right. I don't know. Well, we got some medical billing jobs up at Syracuse, uh, up at Upstate. Why don't, I, why don't I get them an application? You know, that's the network that you really need. That's the network that right. helps people to create opportunities informally as well as formally. And we're looking for that good mix. Um and 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 and, and those, that kind of a, you know role modeling. So we're very very excited about it, and it's a, it's a project that's going to be impactful for the region and as well as the residents on the footprint. Bill Simmons is the executive director of the Syracuse Housing Authority. Bill, thank you for. And there's a lot. Look, we know this was just one piece of the Housing Authority story. There's a whole lot more. Bill, come back and give us the rest of the story. At another time. Bill, thank you so much. Thanks, George. Good seeing you. Inspiration for the nation.